Apologia has a knack for grinding the gears of resurrection apologists with his trademark for the Bible Tells Me So jingle. He has created a huge list of response videos to apologetic superstars about the resurrection, including William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, and Mike Lucona. A lot of people ask me why I don't respond to more of his videos. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons not to respond to Apologia, often because he can come across as a bit unserious and trollish at times. This is also because Apologia and I both have in common that we believe that the minimalist approach just isn't compelling enough to persuade skeptics. You might want to watch my earlier video for more details on that. I'm afraid that the popularity of the minimalist approach has actually helped create this monster called Apologia and other counter-apologists like him. Allow me to explain. Here is a very troubling quote from Dr. William Lane Craig. He says, Evangelicals sometimes give lip service to the claim that the Gospels are historically reliable, even when examined by the canons of ordinary historical research, but I wonder if they really believe this. Although I am a huge fan of Dr. Craig, this feels so odd. Who exactly is he referring to? Is it Craig Blomberg? Peter J. Williams? These scholars seem to be doing a lot more than just giving lip service. Craig goes on to say, So I almost never argue with the unbeliever, about biblical inerrancy. I'll concede for the sake of argument virtually all the errors and inconsistencies in the Old and New Testaments that he wants to bring up, while insisting that the documents collected into what was later called the New Testament are fundamentally reliable when it comes to the central facts undergirding the claims and fate of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I absolutely agree with Dr. Craig that we don't need to nor should we argue for the inerrancy of the Gospels in order to win over an unbeliever. That would be counterproductive. Notice, however, that Craig is not just conceding inerrancy, but also the Gospels' robust reliability. Craig says that a few central facts will do the trick, but can the apologetic task of defending Orthodox Christianity really survive if we are going to grant virtually all the errors and inconsistencies that a skeptic will want to bring up? I'm not so sure. Craig's most popular book, Reasonable Faith, provides a historical sketch of the resurrection approach advanced by 18th century apologists, including William Paley. Paley advanced a trilemma that either the disciples were deceivers, deceived themselves, or were telling the truth. Paley extensively argues for the latter conclusion by defending the gospel's robust reliability. Though Paley's argument can definitely be tweaked and updated, Craig treats it as a fact that this kind of apologetic has been rendered forever obsolete. Why? Well, in short, it's due to the rise of modern biblical criticism. This doesn't seem to be based on actual objective evidence against the Gospels, but our current sociological situation. Craig also recommends that we appeal to facts accepted by the majority of scholars and use the tools of modern biblical criticism such as the criteria of embarrassment, dissimilarity, multiple attestation, and so forth to mine out a set of facts from the Gospels. Most notably, what can be mined out is that Jesus understood himself as the Son of Man depicted in the prophet Daniel, and that he was crucified, buried, and that his tomb was found empty, and the early belief in the post-mortem appearances to the disciples. While these are really important facts that even a lot of skeptics will grant, that is not exactly what I would call strong reliability. Now, Gary Habermas and Dr. Mike Lacona take things a step further, choosing only to use data that the majority of scholars grant. That is how they determine what Lacona calls historical bedrock. This requires a large number of scholars across the spectrum of ideologies because they believe that that ensures us that there must be strong evidence for the proposition and it keeps our horizons or bias in check. Again, we see a sociological situation seemingly determine what we can actually say that we know with much confidence. But is this really right? Well, no, this seems to just be the bandwagon fallacy. For example, we could easily imagine a case where the majority of Democrats and Republicans of various stripes support a certain law or tax measure that ends up doing a lot more harm than actual good. We could think of dozens of other situations like this. In his withering critique of modern biblical scholarship, C.S. Lewis wrote regarding his own discipline. He says, I have learned in other fields of study how transitory the assured results of modern scholarship may be, how soon the scholarship ceases to be modern. The confident treatment to which the New Testament is subjected is no longer applied to profane texts. There used to be English scholars who were prepared to cut up Henry VI between half a dozen authors and assign his share to each. We don't do that now. When I was a boy, one would have been laughed at for supposing that there had been a real Homer. 
the disintegrators seem to have triumphed forever. But Homer seems to be creeping back. Even the belief of the ancient Greeks that the Mycenaeans were their ancestors and spoke Greek has been surprisingly supported. We may now, without disgrace, believe in a historical King Arthur. Everywhere, except in theology, there has been a vigorous growth of skepticism about skepticism itself. We can't help ourselves from muttering, many now in disuse will be revived. We are absolutely kidding ourselves to think that New Testament studies isn't beset with its own set of quirks, prejudices that plague scholars who are given various labels on the scholarly spectrum. After all, this is the discipline that has a hard time deciding whether Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet, an eccentric desert teacher, a cynic philosopher, a liberation theologian, and so on. Any so-called scholarly consensus is worth way less than one might initially pre-reflectively believe. Now, speaking as someone on the inside, biblical scholar Richard Bauckham says consensus often has to do with the sociology of knowledge as it has with the compelling nature of the hypothesis. Well, bingo. Because of the constraints of this methodology, Mike Lacona has said that we can't treat the gospel resurrection narratives as historical bedrock because of scholarly doubts about the unknowns, such as the amount of liberty the evangelist may have taken in the reports. In his big book on the resurrection, Mike writes, We might affirm with great confidence that Peter had such an experience in an individual setting, and we will see that the same may be said of the adversary of the church named Paul. We may likewise affirm that there was at least one occasion where a group of Jesus' followers, including the Twelve, had such an experience. Did other experiences reported by the Gospels occur as well, such as the appearances to the women, Thomas, the Emmaus disciples, and the multiple group appearances reported in the tradition in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-7 in John? Where did these experiences occur? Historians may be going beyond what the data warrants and assigning a verdict with much confidence to these questions. If we are willing to say that the appearances to the Emmaus disciples or Thomas are not really all that defensible, then I think there seems to be a big problem. If there are embellishments, this would be exactly where one would expect to find them. It's been argued that even if Luke invented the physical details in his narrative, this somehow doesn't matter because he invented them in order to convey what the apostles really believed. Because after all, Luke was a companion of Paul and Paul believed in bodily resurrection, so the other apostles must have also. So supposedly it's not a big deal if Luke made up an actual scene where Jesus appeared in a physical body. But why not just tell us about the real appearances if they were so bodily? I'm afraid that skeptics see this for the mental gymnastics that it is. The apologist is obviously working against himself here. And if we take minimalism to its logical conclusions, we end up admitting that we can't know with a high degree of certainty about a lot of what Jesus really said and did in the Gospels from a historical perspective. For example, the prevailing view is that whoever wrote John, they felt free to invent entire speeches and put them in Jesus' mouth. Several evangelical scholars even accept this, so we have a consensus with scholars represented all across the spectrum. Would this count as historical bedrock? According to Lacona's criteria, it would. Are we really okay with that? Do we accept some of Jesus' sayings as historical fact, but want to say that the story of Thomas is something that we have to accept by blind faith? On what grounds can I say with any confidence that Jesus said, I and my Father are one, in arguing with the Jehovah's Witness if I adopt this minimalist mindset? When the evangelist says that his testimony is true, we have a decision to make. We had best believe based on good reasons. This is the cost of minimalism. All right, so getting back to my strange bedfellow, Apologia, in many ways, he already has the consensus on his side. And in the light of the minimalist concessions, completely fair or not, here's what the skeptic hears. The biblical critics are right. They're saying that the gospels are not highly reliable and the big league apologists actually admit it. You guys can mine what you will out of those unreliable documents using the scholar's tools, but the majority already has used those tools and come to much different conclusions than you. You're stepping outside of the box of scholarly consensus because of your bias, so I'm obviously going to hit you with my For the Bible Tells Me So jingle. Because Dr. Lacona is so admirably transparent about the fact that scholars differ on the perceived nature of the experiences, any pop-level apologist making reference to the appearances in the Gospels will be immediately told that they're naively breaking the rules laid down by the big-name resurrection apologists. Apology and other counter-apologists like him see that there are scholars who accept the minimal facts but don't think that bodily resurrection is the best explanation of the data. Because of the minimalist restrictions, any vague or fleeting experience that they can come up with can easily explain away the resurrection appearances to the disciples. And any attempt to bolster the argument by the apologist will just go beyond the minimal facts. 
I think it would be much better to simply argue that the resurrection accounts in the Gospels are what the disciples reported as to what happened to them right up front. Enough of this end run approach. And I believe that this can be supported by arguments for the reliability of the Gospels. Rumors of the Paley style argument's death have been greatly exaggerated. I'll show you how to make that argument in a future video, but just know this, because something isn't granted by liberal scholars doesn't mean that it's weakly supported by non-question begging evidence, nor does it mean that we're making a for the Bible tells me so argument based on inerrancy. Sadly, I fear that this decades-long reliance on the minimal facts strategy has resulted in an apologetics community that is now full of people who can't even argue this way or who are unsure whether or not the evidence even supports it. In short, minimalism has fostered a lack of nerve. One of the main goals of my channel is to show how wrong-headed this idea is.